Rodrigo, ahí la tiene Marabona, lo marcan dos, pisa la pelota Marabona, arranca por la brecha del genio del fútbol mundial, y es el tercero que va a tocar para Borrecha, que siempre Marabona, genio, 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 ta, 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 Hey guys, welcome to Dragon's Voice Podcast. I don't know how many episodes we're in, but I'm enjoying every single moment of it. And for some of you who have been following the Dragon's Voice Podcast recently, I want to say thank you so much for like, sharing, subscribing all to the channel, all to the videos and that. And especially as well, I want to thank you for following on Twitter at Dragon's Voice 20. And uh, for some of you guys who've actually been uh, asking me to uh, bring back some old guests onto the show already, and I'm really a bit surprised about that because uh, I think this is, is, this is probably my 30th episode. And uh, for some of you guys on here, you've been asking for this particular person, including my dad and my uncle, actually, who are uh, big Everton uh, fans. But I'm actually really glad because the last time uh, I had this particular person on the show, I did not know how Zoom worked. I did not know what was the consequences or anything, but now I've got him back on the show. He's an Everton legend. He's a Wales legend. He's captained uh, both teams. It's none other than Kevin Ratcliffe. Kevin, how's it going, pal? I'm all right, pal. Yeah, I didn't know which way to take it when you said uh, old guests. Old guests are. <laughs> well, as in old, as in, you know, you've had him on before. Or old yeah, as no, I've had him on before. I'm, I'm getting, uh, I mean, I'm 24 and I'm going a bit grey in some areas. So, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I see your forehead showing, yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, the last time we, we, we had you on the show, um, of course, we were talking about you playing for Everton, you know, winning the oh. European Cup, Winners' Cup, a few FA Cup moments. Uh, we talked about Neville Southall, um, you playing for Cardiff City and everything. And like I said, with the whole problem with um, Zoom, I, I did not know how to use it because I had so many more questions, you know, during your time still at Everton against... Um, you know, when you're playing for Wales, you played against Germany and Brazil, big wins. And, and funny enough, one of my uh, mates uh, at the fo uh, Barrytown Football Club, he said to me, why did you not mention those two games? I will never know. And I just went, well, <laughs> time. It was time. Yeah, I did yeah. not know. Yeah. But I'm glad we can just go cruise this. Uh, right. Have a, an hour just to talk about football and everything. And I really enjoyed the... Uh, the, the culture of Liverpool, where you were talking about um, the football and music were the big, you know, big part mm -hmm. of uh, Liverpool. So I wanted to just talk about that very quickly, just going, uh, going back. Yeah. To, uh, I watched the um, Howard's Way documentary, which we mentioned last time. Um, so how important was it for the culture and, football, uh, culture and football and music in Liverpool, and especially around that time? Yeah, uh, well, you know, uh, look, there was, there was all sorts going on. There was... Um, Obviously, riots within the obviously Liverpool Toxford area and everything. I think a lot of that was to do with unemployment, um, and really it was a bit of a depression. Uh, but I think football and music, uh, in especially in the mid '80s, with both clubs doing well, you can imagine if one club's only doing well, there's only going to be one part of the town or the city that's going to be joyous. But uh, at that time, it was two parts of the town were joyous you know, enjoying football, but also enjoying the music because you think about the groups that have come out of Liverpool in the 80s, you know, it was uh, it was just tremendous really and something really that I think, you know, it, it, I think it helped when it was good music as well. <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't know what you think because obviously you're saying you're, you're a whippersnapper really. Yeah. You know, if, you, if you, you, you know, you won't even remember some of the groups, you know, like Dead or Alive and, things like that, um, sort of Echo and the Bunnymen, it's uh, Frankie Goes to Hollywood, you know, all, they've all had number one hits and, and things like that. And it was just like, uh, you know, you, you, you look at my parents in the 60s was a great era, but it was only a great era for music. You know, okay, you could say that in, in Britain, uh, in England, maybe they had a World Cup in 66, but really, you know, for one city just to have so much joy in one way, and so much heartache in another, um, but no, it was it, it was a good time to be alive and sort of uh, out and about and enjoying. Yeah, and uh, when we go on to the the football, of course, you know in Liverpool you have Everton and Liverpool, and then if you look at the other Merseyside towns, there was uh, Tramia as well, I think. And um, uh, but 
with, with that in mind, you know, with Tramien, where is his phone's going off then? <laughs> but uh, with that, um, when you were growing up yourself, um, was you an Everton fan? Was you a Wrexham fan, Liverpool, or was it? Um, well, look, I, I, I supported, uh, obviously, Everton was my first team. But, um, yeah, Wrexham. I, I used to go to Wrexham one weekend and Everton the weekend after to, to watch them both play, you know. And uh, the, the only thing is, one was a train journey, the other one was a bus. Um, believe it or not, to go to Everton, I used to go on the coach, the, the coach, the bus. Uh, whereas to go to Wrexham, I could get the train. Um and the good thing about Wrexham was you could sit behind the goal, one goal, one off, and then the next half you can go and sit around the other end, um, the other goal. So that that was good that you you know you had the freedom to move around the pitch. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's uh, you know there, there were two teams I always looked out, and then you know funny enough when I went into management, I went and managed Chester, which was the arch rivals of of Wrexham. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I wasn't liked by Wrexham fans. Well, still not really. I don't suppose. <laughs> I think that's one of the reasons. I think it was more known for a, a, being a Liverpool supported club rather than a, an Everton supported club was Wrexham. Yeah, yeah. Um, especially as well, you know, with um, with that in mind, when you were playing, for, when you had your career at Everton and everything, you know, Howard Kendall, i got to mention him, and he a uh, big, important figure, you know, and uh, rest, God rest his soul, you know, but he was, he was Mr. Everton, you know, um, because he, he led a lot of success, you know, FA Cup victories, Charity Shields, the European Cup when it's cut the league. Well, you were there most of it. Mm. Um, but with Harold Kendall, you know, uh, a big personality as he is, is there any particular moment for you for, um, that sticks out for you with uh, Harold Kendall as a, as a person? Uh, in, in what respect do you mean? Um, just any moment, you know, where... Y- you look back as a memory to think, oh, Howard Kendall, what a guy, you know, regardless of manager. Yeah. Well, he, he wasn't, it wasn't long after he finished playing football, really, that he'd become a manager. Um, I played with him as a, a as the manager. He was manager at Everton. He actually played a few times. Um, so he still had a bit of like player mentality in him, as in the fact that he wanted the players looking after, after, when it was right to look after the players. And I remember one trip, we were in New Zealand after we'd won the league um, and we had to go to this function. Um, And we got there and all of a sudden we had to pay for our own drinks. And we we didn't want to go in the first place. So we'd sort of, I would got this inkling that we didn't want to go. Um, And then we had it and then he'd come come over to, to me and a few of the other guys standing at the bar buying our drinks and he said look lads he says have that drink and if you want to go you can go somebody's making a lot of money here uh, and the guys come over um, and tried to persuade us to stay um, and we just we just left within five or six ten minutes you know because you know they got us there with the promise um, really to other people that they got uh, full access to us and we were bombarded, I must admit, since the minute we gone in to the minute we left. But these these guys were making money on the back of us being over there. And Howard didn't like the fact that we weren't looking after the players or himself, really, as well. Now, I think that just showed you what he was about. That he, you know, he didn't want didn't want any of us to be taken for granted, and he didn't want to be taken for granted, and he didn't want the football club to be taken for granted. So even though it was a club tour. It was something separate from the tour that I think, I don't know if the club had actually agreed to, but without really, you know, without the players' permission, really. Um, so we, we did go along, and uh, um, but we, I don't think we stayed that, that long. I don't think so, not, not after he said that we could go anyway. Yeah, so and a long the, way to go for something you're not expecting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And especially with Harry Kendall, he brought in a lot of um, young, talented players. He brought in Big Nev, you know, and uh, he brought in uh, Pat Van der Maal, you know, there was Peter Reid, uh, Andy Gray. Um, I mean, I could go on and on. But there's one particular player I want to mention. And um, funny enough, me and my dad were speaking about him the other day because uh, uh, we were watching... Um, Funny enough, we were watching the Everton game. Uh, it wasn't Everton v Man United, uh, the, the the one that's just gone gone now. It was, I think, it was the other one. And um, and Dad mentioned Adrian Heath. Uh, he just yeah. came out and just mentioned Adrian Heath for some reason. And we were talking about him. And 
he said, um, and for some reason, he, he, he talked about the current Everton team, saying it's not gluing like it was back in that day. There's something not right. There's something gluing. Yeah. And, he kept, and then when he mentioned Adrian Heath, he mentioned that time when um, he got tackled. Uh, was it Brian Howard, if I'm right? Marwood. Uh, Marwood. Brian Marwood. And, uh, and then Peter, and it was like, um, Peter Reed just went off him and tried to tackle him. But was it, but during that time, that game, um, was all of you on to him at that point? moments when he tackled Adrian Heath or was it just Peter Reed and maybe one or two others? Um, no, I think it was <laughs> I think it was quite knowledgeable that you know that was uh, we were out to get a little bit of revenge really on Brian, even though he wasn't that type of person um and that type of player. I just, I just think that Adrian was a little bit unfortunate. You know, it could have happened to any one of us. Um and he wasn't unfortunate, but we did take it personal. I think Reedy had smashed him, I'd smashed him. I think and a couple of others were trying to. Um, and Brian knew that as well. Um, but, uh, you know, unfortunately for Brian, it, it sticks with, you know, a lot of Evertonians. But he's not a bad, he's not a bad guy. And uh, he, if you know him, uh, I don't know him greatly, but I know that it's it, that wouldn't have been in his character to deliberately go out and hurt Adrian Heath anyway. But uh, he was missed because he was on a great run at the time. He was scoring goals left, right and centre. I think it was him and uh, Sharpie up front for the first part of the season. I think Andy Gray was sat on the bench for the first 10 to 12 games. Couldn't get in, couldn't break into the team. And it was, uh, you know, Adrian's misfortune and uh, become Andy's fortune, really, um, of, of taking that opportunity once again. It was a good replacement to have, by the way. Yeah. Um, so that was the strength of the, cl the the squad. But I think he was, you know, then denied playing for England um, because he was on a great run, was Adrian. You know, he, he was an old... I, I would say he was a foreign type of player. Um, it, he wasn't quick, but he, he was busy. Um, you know, he, he'd anticipate a lot of things. He, he'd make centre-halves head it where he wanted it heading. Um, and, and sort of anticipate where they were going to head it. Um, it. Had little dummy runs that he used to make. Um, he used to go one way, then the other. Uh, and the good thing with Adrian, and if he, if he ever come off short for a ball, he wanted the ball knocking long. And if he went long for a ball, you knew that he was going to come short. <laughs> um, and and that's what type of play he was a clever thinking player. And um, he early on in his career, he couldn't he couldn't hit a barn door. Um, and that's when Howard moved into the midfield. Um, and if you look at the 84 Cup final, Adrian Heath and Peter Reid played centre midfield. Um, and, that, and that was really Howard's thinking of taking the pressure off Adrian, playing as a striker. So I played him in midfield and it, it worked a treat because, like I said, he was a busy player anyway. He used to work his socks off if he played up front, right wing, left wing or at centre midfield. So he, he suited us. You know, when you just mentioned the FA Cup final then, especially against uh, Watford, you were in 2-0 and that. Um, did you ever meet Elton John around that area? Because he was, uh, I think he was chairman or owner of Watford at the time. And, yeah, uh, yeah. No, we never, we, well, obviously he was on the pitch at the time. Um, and, you know, in and around. But I never really went over and shook hands with him or anything. It wasn't, uh, you know, we had our own star there on, the, on, that, on that day. And that was a, a guy called Freddie Star, who was a top comic in them days. Yeah. Um, so, you know, Freddie Starr being with, within our circle uh, before the game was, was a, a big advantage to us, took a little bit of pressure off us because he was just sort of cracking jokes and uh, playing, the, playing the fool as he usually did. Yeah, as a com comic as well, because I remember there was part in the documentary where he was standing outside, there was like a hotel of Flatterson and there was just you guys just popping your heads out and he was there going, hey, I was going just cracking jokes and everything. Well, he, he was dressed up as a German. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in wellies and he was well it was Adolf Hitler he was dressed up as uh, I'm not too sure if you'd be able to do that now no, uh, no with, with with wellies on and that was one of his sort of uh, acts um, that was eight o'clock in the morning half past eight in the morning of a cup final day and we're hanging out the window but he was uh, he was a very funny man it was uh, you know was, he was one of my sort of uh, comic kings when I was growing up because he, he just couldn't just it wasn't a comic. I think he was, you know, a good singer uh, and he, he was a good impersonator as well. And you see that some of the things he did, I think the only thing is with Freddie, he never really changed too much of his act as he went on and on and on. 
Um, and you know that when you're on TV, you've got to be able to change your act on a number of occasions to change your, your you know, your impressions. But he, I'll tell you what, he's, he did a mean Elvis Presley. Um, and he was a, you know, impersonator as well, singer. Fantastic. And uh, going back on to Howard Kendall, but his assistant manager, this is what I really want to mention, it was uh, Colin Harvey. And because... Uh, you know, it was just a dynamic duo of those two, you know, him, Colin being the assistant manager with Howard Kendall being the manager as well. But um, mm -hmm. when, uh, when Colin took over as manager, when uh, I think at the time Howard left, was there any change at all within his way of doing things? Because considering that he was assistant manager and he moved up to being a, a manager yeah. for Everton, did, was there any change to his plannings? I don't think the first year there was a, not that much of a change other than the personnel that was coming in. Um, but the second year, I think he decided to change it and do it his way and what he thought needed tweaking. Um, but you know, for some reason or other, it didn't work out for Colin. Um, it, I don't think Colin was the best communicator. Um, so, you know, to be a manager, you need to communicate with your your players and your man management of the players completely different than man managing them when you're a coach. Uh, and I think that was it. And I think a few of the signings that he made weren't up to the task. You know, there was, uh, there was, there was a few that were, you know, I would say that weren't Evertonians and maybe, you know, the recruitment that he brought in wasn't as good as what was already there. Do you know what? It I think that's, that's the hardest thing to do though. When you've got a yeah. side like we had, is replacing them players when they are coming to the end of their careers. Uh, and it must be a very, very difficult task for a manager. That when you've got, which you class them as more or less world-class players, how do, you, how do you actually, you know, bring in world-class players when you've got no European football? Yeah, um, exactly. Because you know, that's what we do. We didn't have European football at that time, mainly because of the, you know, the ban. Yeah, the highs of uh, stadium disaster. You know what? It was uh, it was Big Nev who said that um, if if that didn't happen, you know, Everton would have probably been Everton would have been a different uh, club at that time or a different team. You know, it may be they go. It could be a different club now. Yeah, you know, um, as much as it would have been then, I think it would have been a, a different club now, and maybe for the last twenty five years, um, I don't think the club's really recovered from it. No, um, you know that I think. We'll, you know, we, we suffered more than anybody by having that ban, um, you know, which was, you know, when you look in hindsight, that it's something that maybe shouldn't have happened um, and, and we should have been allowed to play. And I'm certainly sure that it wouldn't happen these days now. There'd be too much uproar about it. Yeah, no. And especially as well, we got the, there's this uh, proposal with a lot of big clubs in England, uh, considering the fact they want to ha have their European Super League or European Competition yeah. League. And, yeah. and I think that's just an absolute disaster waiting to happen because it's just... Well, it's what you've got is if you've got American owners, all they're seeing is pounds, shilling and pence, or dollars, cents. And, yeah, cha-ching, uh, you know. Cha-ching, yeah. They, they're not interested in, you know... Any, anybody else within the football leagues they're not interested in the lower leagues they're interested about their club mm. you know and making a profit um you know that and, and that's that's their american way so yeah. you know it is, it is sad it is sad I, i'm very sort of um you know unhappy with that myself you know i think it'll be a disaster for british football you know in the long run um i i think it will be definitely do you know what? Um, I want to mention this because you said American owners and uh, considering the fact that I was surprised with Liverpool to, to even mention that because these American owners that they've got, you know, they're, they're very sporting businessmen, you know, because considering the fact they own the Boston Red Sox um, in, in the States and everything. Mm. So um, I was really surprised that they're trying to do something stupid like that. But then again, um, being American owners, like you said, you know, you don't really be surprised about that. But there's other mm -hmm. American owners, and we mentioned Wrexham. <laughs> so it's all going a bit Hollywood a bit because Ryan Reynolds and Rob, um, uh, I, can't, I can't pronounce his name, Michael Henney, um, his name yeah. is. Um, I was well, why are they doing it? Yeah. Well, that's why are they doing it? That, um, is, there, is there a documentary in the making? <laughs> Do you know what um, they were mentioning that? Yeah. Is, is, it, is it that? Um, is, it a, is it an ideal place for another hotel? Um, I, I don't know, you know, another supermarket, whatever. 
do you know what somebody said to me years and years ago and this is when uh, i was managing at chester and so you, you're talking football league lower tier and somebody said to to him then this is like 96 97 and somebody said to one of my directors who's your sugar daddy and they went well what do you mean he said, well who's pumping seven grand into this club a month because that's what it takes Mm. Well, then it did seven grand a month extra on top of the money you got from the football league and everything and the gates that was supporting the club. Um, and do you know what? The whoever it was sort of laughed it off, you know, and, and never thought. But do you know what? When he sat down and thought about it, he wasn't far wrong. It might differ from other clubs, but you know, it's got to be a passion for lower league chairman, you know, to be throwing that type of money at a football club when you know you can't get it back. You're hoping maybe you get one person every three or four years to go for maybe a couple of million. Um, but that's not happening as much as it did, you know, years ago. Um, so it's it's going to be interesting to see, you know, with this European lock, what's going to happen. Yeah, no, I, I understand that as well. And the after effect as well. The after effect that it's going to have oh, on yeah. the club. Absolutely. You know? And do you know yeah. what I was? Um, I, I read because um, there was this interview. Maybe Swansea will go in it. Sorry. <laughs> Maybe Swansea will go in it. They've got well, American owners. <laughs> oh, that will be the day. That will. Be. But you never know. with kind of be Malaysian owners, you know, because um, you just never know with the football clubs these days because of the foreign owners and that. Um, it's 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 a bit you know um, weird to say the least because of uh, what is going on. And uh, yes. in the fact that uh, I think your screen went uh, a bit there. I know. I'm just trying to find it where it is again now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm using my phone because I couldn't get it on my laptop. Um, where are we, mate? Uh, is it like a video uh, button on the... Uh, it goes to Zoom and then that's about it. Oh, one minute. Let me help you out here. Sorry for this. Yeah, I'm going to go back to your link. Yeah, ah, now they are. I could have done it. I've never seen that there. Uh, open. There we go. Should be okay now. Here we go. Here we go. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't see your ID number underneath. I just went to the link. Okay, fair enough. No worries. Um, yeah. No, like, uh, like I was saying earlier, um, you know, because with uh, a lot of foreign owners coming in, you know, uh, it's, it's a lot of uh, worrying for British uh, football fans whether in England, Scotland, Wales and that, or Northern mm. Ireland, you know, because of foreign owners, you don't know what plans or wild ideas are coming from. And it's ideas like that European yeah. Super League going in. It's just, you know... Uh, I don't think it's just that. I think, you know, this in this sort of thing that we've got now with the lockdowns and, and things like that, um, football's in a, in a strange place as well. You know, and it's very delicate. Um, I, I'd hate to sort of think how many people are out of job in football through to, you know, this, um, this virus. Um, you know, how can, how can clubs afford to sign players on long-term contracts? Oh. Um, so if players had their contracts up this year, um, it's one of the first times the clubs are in the driving seat for a long time, yeah. as in what you're getting offered. And I, it would have been a, maybe a fraction because they can't afford to commit to anything. Um, so I would imagine that you'd see a lot of players out of work come the end of this last season uh, and going into this season. I, I'd hate to imagine how many are, uh, are not working now, haven't got clubs. Whereas, you know, they would have been snapped up before. Um, mm. you, you know, I, do, I don't think Joe Ledley or Ashley Williams have got clubs at the moment. I'm not quite sure. Ashley Williams is what? playing for Bristol City. And is Joe he Ledley, still there, though? Yeah. I thought his contract was still up. It was oh, up. Well, I don't know. Well, I know for a fact Joe Ledley's playing in Australia, Newcastle Jets. I know he's, oh, he's gone to Australia, yeah. yeah. Well, I know the Welsh FA won't be paying any expenses for him to get home. No, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. Yeah. You know, I, I do yeah. miss uh, Joe Ledley because I would have imagined, I would have thought that considering when Cardiff City were... Um, on the verge, you know, in the playoffs and everything, there was the what if scenario of, of um, should they bring back the likes of Joe Ledley and Chris Gunter? And there was a mm. lot of fans for it, but there was a lot of fans against it. 
because they wanted, you know, just to move on. And because the ones who were against it, they wanted just to move on and just try and get new players who were bold, uh, dynamic, and everything. But there were those who were not optimistic to say, well, hang on. With Joe Ledley and Chris Gunter, they're former Cardiff City players. They've got the experience. They've played top flight football. They played in the international levels, you know, in, mm. in some of the top teams. Maybe they are beneficial. Maybe they are useful. I've always been, well, Cardiff should always do that because, not because of nostalgia or, um, you know, because it's Joe Ledley and Chris Gunter, but considering the fact that where they've come from and how far they've come, you know, it wouldn't be surprised that, you know, if they did. But, you know, it's... Do you mean for Wales or do you mean for Cardiff? For Cardiff, uh, that is. Uh, I, would say, I would say more so for um, international level than club level. Mm. They'll be more valuable. Um, you know, the, the two guys you mentioned are, are not bad eggs. They're not going to disrupt the camp if they're not playing. You know, they're, they're, they're one of them that will want to help, you know, the players around them. And I think that's, you know, something in international football you can do at club level to bring people back to do that. Maybe not. Maybe not. But at at international level, I wouldn't disagree. I would would think that as a manager, you want them around, you know, to to make the other... And you can always fall back on them. You know, they're not going to be first choice. Um, They're most probably going to be playing in friendly matches rather than competitive matches. Um, But you want them around to feed their experience into the younger element, especially with us having such a young squad and inexperienced squad. Um... And if you've not got any of the big guys not playing who have got the caps, then, you, you know, they're, they're going to be vulnerable. Um, and obviously, they're not, not learning. Um, and it's something that, you know, when I look back on my career, that I wish that I was still involved in some sort of a way with the international, when you've come to the end of your career at an international level. Um, and I'm sure a few other lads would have hung around as well. And I think that role really needs to be explained to them players. Because the last thing you want is that player coming in being so disappointed he's disruptive to the rest of the squad. And he's he's a bad egg. It becomes a bad egg. Um, but the two guys you mentioned in Chris Gunter and Joe Ledley, I wouldn't have thought they would be. No, no, absolutely. And, uh, and you know, the way they've con- uh, contributed as well to Wales and to their respected clubs as well, you know where they stand. And maturely, they're not, like you said, they're not bad eggs. And, you know, they're not going to be in the media for the wrong reasons. And, in, and I mean... If, you, if you're looking at it back then, I mean, Chris Gunt and Joe Ledley, they've always been the outside. I mean, during the new 2016s, they were the ones, apart from Ramsey and Bale, they were the ones that stood out because I don't know about Joe Ledley's dancing, but I mean, he was there because yeah. he, he, was, yeah. he was a key player. And then it was Chris Gunt, he was a key player. I think, his beard, I think his beard helped him, didn't it? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Sort of publicity. <laughs> um, I, think, I think Joe Allen as well would be a, a big plus in all that. Mm. And I think Ben Davis. You know, but for me, Ben Davis and, and, and Joe Allen were most probably, other than Gareth Bale scoring his goals, I think they were the standout people in them six, in the 16, you know, um, uh, Euros. Yeah. Uh, I thought they were outstanding, absolutely outstanding. And, uh, you know, Aaron and, 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 Joe, uh, and uh, Gareth played their part, but for me, them two, you know, consistency was fantastic. Let's go on to Wales then, because you've had a very, you know, great career. Um, in terms of, you know, for you, for playing for Wales, it was great. And um, it was unfortunate, you know, the qualifications for the World Cup to, or the Euro Championships, as they were called then, uh, wasn't uh, uh, the best. However, you know, there were some particular moments out there for you that stood out, especially against Brazil and Germany in the early 90s, which I'll get on to in a minute. But I wanted to mention this one because when I was doing my research um, and I got some of the old questions up there, I just wanted to know your opinion on this and your story about it. But it was, uh, I know you got called up in the early 80s, but I don't know when you, it, it didn't show when you started. So, um, all right, check us uh, back here at home, Cardiff. Yeah, was, oh, was it? Park, 1981. I think it 1981, was, was it? I think it was, yeah. And because uh, I'm, I'm reading here, because they, uh, they used to have the British Home Championship. You know, yeah. All the countries going at it in, in the UK and everything. But there was one particular moment where um, uh, the Wales squad and the England squad refused to go to Northern Ireland because of the troubles that, that happened. Yeah, um, yeah. Could you... I think, I think we you... went there one year. Went there one year. So it would have been two years later after that. So I think we went in 83... But I don't think we went in, I think it was 82 or 83, but we never went 
in whatever it was, 84, 85. I think that's when we stopped going. I think that's when the home internationals actually stopped. Yeah. Um, and I think if you, if I'm not wrong, I think Northern Ireland were the last people team to actually win the home internationals, weren't they? I, I read about it and Northern Ireland did stood out, you know, and uh, I know they yeah. won it. Um, I, think it was, I think it was a bind, the home internationals. It was coming a bind to England. So, you know, you know when it becomes a bind to anybody, any excuse. Yeah. But it was getting to the stage that we weren't comfortable in going away. Um, because the first time we went away, you know, when you've got sort of guards on your, on your coach, you know, with an Uzo in the pocket, and then you've got sort of um, sentries um, on, the, on the gate of the hotel uh, and barbed wire right around the hotel. Uh, although that you know sports wasn't really uh, hampered you know when there was a conflict with Ireland um, you know but there was always you could always be the first and I think more of a, a fuss was being kicked up by the older players who had families um, and rightly so um, I think that was only a matter of time before they stopped them um, and I, I, I don't know how many home internationals are played in but it must have been you know, over half a dozen at least. You know, if you played like, what was it, three a year, then yeah, I would have played definitely in over half a dozen, maybe 10 home international games. So, you know, you, you're getting the opportunity then to play in England every other year. Um, and, you know, to be fair, we did pretty well against England. I think we beat them 2-0, two, two was it? Or 2-1. 84, Sparky's first game. Um, we beat them. Uh, I got in. The, the Welsh squad after the 4-1 win, four win win against England at Wrexham. I think that was 81. I think um, Ian Walsh scored a couple of goals. Was it Mickey Thomas? Was it that infamous one? with? Because was it Mike England that he, he, um, he came in, but the players, did, the players didn't meet him until well, three days before the... Yes, the, I think it was. Yeah, he'd yeah. come over from Vancouver where he was um, living and working. I think he'd been a manager of Vancouver Whitecaps. So I think he got a business over there. I think he got some sort of timber yard over there. And he'd come over and it was funny because, you know, he's using all these phrases, you know, like advance, not go forward, you advance and <laughs> let's get the hell out of here. <laughs> it was uh, yeah, a little bit like John Wayne, <laughs> for those who can remember John Wayne. <laughs> yeah. I can just see uh, Mike England just coming in now. It's like, uh, right, we got to get the hell out. It's like, he's totally yeah. bloody well. <laughs> <laughs> I was, uh, it was, um, a lot of fun times, you know. I, I've got a lot of time for Mike because he he gave me my opportunity. Um, and like everything, you know, you've got to change. You sort of brought me in, brought Rushy in, uh, then brought Sparky in later on. Um, and it was just, uh, you know, just one after another really that he was bringing in, you know. And it was it was one of them periods where it needed to be done because the older lads, the Terry Horace of the world, the Leighton Phillipses of the world and Josh Mahoney's were all getting an age where maybe they've gone past their international date, really. Um, but, like I said before, I'm not too sure if it would have been them because finance, you know, they, they, they complain about, you know, if they'd knock a fiver off your, um, what's her name, your expenses, just to prove a point. Um, in them days so uh, you know to, to maybe bring Terry Yorath all the way over from Vancouver and not play him would be a no-go mm -hmm. so you know even though his sort of experience of international football would have run through to the likes of me and Ian um, uh, and, and people like that um, Sparky coming through do you know with uh, Ian Rush then, he's a good friend of yours and uh, you know, mm. roommate, um, but fierce rivals because you, uh, obviously you were uh, Mr. Everton, he was Mr. Liverpool, definitely Mr. Liverpool. I mean, he's worshipped at, at Liverpool considering yeah. what he's contributed. But um, did the, um, was there ever the, the friendship between you two? Did it ever, uh, did it ever became, not sour in, in the spot that it would be sour in the long term, but do you know when Everton and Liverpool were going to play, was there ever you two no. passion heads? And, no, just a bit of friendly banter. Oh, yeah, all the yeah. and then let's enjoy yeah. our drinks at the hotel room when we go and play for Wales or Wales. Yeah. yeah, well, you know, God, God, there's some games we were playing against each other on the Saturday and in the week we've been playing international football together. Uh, and we've been away to Spain or wherever it was, and we've been rooming together for four or five days. So you come back at the weekend and you're playing against each other. 
Um, but it was always normal service re resume type of thing. But it was no, never fell out over over, over anything. I don't think. No, need, can't even yeah. remember. Do you know what? He needs to get that moustache back. I, I met him from, uh, a couple of years ago. Guys, old school. But I looked at him thinking, you need to bring back that moustache, mate. <laughs> uh, I'm not. I mean, I, he's the only player that I know who's actually got better uh, better looking as he's got older. <laughs> 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 Do you know what? Who was um, because Big Nev. Obviously, he had a moustache and everything, but uh, yeah. was there ever... Hey, like... I, had, I had one when I was younger as well. Hey, hey. <laughs> but it was always those two, uh, the, 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 the stood out moustaches and everything. But uh, who do you yeah. think worked it a bit more? Was it Rush or was it Salto who had the, the one that stood out with the moustache? Do you know what? I don't think they were really proper moustaches. <laughs> Either of them. You, you, know when you, 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 you know when you have a bristle of, 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 a, of, a, of a tash? Yeah, and it's hard. They, they, these were still like as if they were sixteen year old with bum fluff around them. <laughs> you know? It could easily um, blow away. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, I don't think they were real. <laughs> I don't think they were real sashes. No, no. <laughs> That's yeah. amazing. Oh, yeah. I, 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 I honestly believe. Yeah, I, you know, I can't really think of them as real moustaches you know when you see a real moustache and it's thick and it's like yeah. you know it's like a groucho marx type thing um which you all know who groucho marx is but it yeah no they weren't real <laughs> <laughs> so maybe they are better off <laughs> yeah <laughs> otherwise it'd be gone with the wind again like yeah. well, i'm just yeah. gone yeah. but um going on to wales again um you were talking about the travels and everything and uh, there was one particular that really stood out for me because when i was doing the going back on the research and everything, the, it mentioned um, because during that time with the British Home Championships and everything, and yeah. when you were playing for Wales, uh, especially under Mike England, um, there was such a fierce rivalry between Wales and England. England seemed to be, it was uh, like, it was tense. I'm thinking, well, I, I, I know it's a bit tense now, but yeah. looking, looking back then, to me, I'm reading it thinking, oh my God, I mean, th they were complaining a lot about the things. And one stood out for me was, you travelled to Soviet Union, but you had to go from, what was it, from Riga to then, I can't pronounce the first one, uh, Tbilisi or Tbilisi. So Tbilisi. Tbilisi, that's it. And yeah. then uh, England would accuse, and I don't know if it was you or Soviet Union or whatever, that uh, it was trying to get in their heads or something for bad rooms or anything. Could you tell us a bit more about how, you know, travelling to those places in the Soviet Union, you know? Yeah. Well, obviously, <laughs> you've got to sort of give yourself another two to three hours to get through security mm. um czech bart charlie was in czechoslovakia which was another place you couldn't get into without being fully checked um you know, i remember going to like say riga and then riga to moscow moscow to tbilisi i think it was something like that but i think it was two stop-offs before you actually got there um and we were playing in tbilisi which couldn't have been i think it's I think the only only place further than that is Azerbaijan, going east. So um, I suppose Azerbaijan would have been part of Russia. Something like that, yeah. In the past, something like most probably. I'm not sure. Um, and it's it's really it's really a Turkish region, if you think about it. The colour of the skin's a lot darker than uh, normal Russians. Um, and they didn't really like the Russian national anthem either, so it was a little bit... But when you're in a stadium out there, and there's most probably, I would say, three-quarters of the stadium are army. You know, there's 50-odd thousand, 60,000 in the stadium. But like I said, there's, there's most probably two-thirds to three-quarters that are, are, are actually, you know, sort of army. They're all in army clothes. Um, and just to get there was... A, a full day and maybe a bit more um, and like I said you know you go from airport to airport you didn't have to get off in Riga because it was just a refuel um, but then Moscow and then I think it was Tbilisi but you know trying to get into the country and I always remember there's a lad called Terry Boyle uh, and he was about I think he was about 26 something like that 25 but his passport photo was coming to an end if you know what I mean yeah so that passport picture would have been when he was 15. Well, he looked nothing like that passport picture. <laughs> if any a man has changed, well, sometimes you can always tell the difference. Or you tell, not tell the difference, but tell 
that is that person. With him, you couldn't tell it was he looked a complete, looked like somebody else's passport. Mm. So he was having problems getting through security. So we were behind him. There was me, Mickey Thomas, um, Joey Jones, and Rushy, and we're all behind in the queue. And we knew for a fact that he was going to have problems going through. We, for some reason, we knew it. And we were behind and we were laughing our heads off. We couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> and he was getting, and, and the fellas behind the desk were like pointing at the photograph and then pointing at him as if to say, is this you? And he kept nodding his head. And we were just going like this. <laughs> <laughs> we were there just for him over an hour. Well, in the end, these two guys behind the um, in passport control couldn't stop laughing. As soon as they started laughing, within five minutes, they were removed. And another time, these guys went in. Well, we had to go through all that again, didn't we? <laughs> so they, was, they were doing the same. They were pointing at the picture and then pointing at him as if to say, is this your picture? And all we were doing was going, no, it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we eventually got through. Mm. But, you know, this is how bad it is when you get over there. We played the game, we lost the game. And then coming back then, you know, you, you knew they were up to tricks and everything, the Russians, um, you know, getting in the country and all that. Um, and I think this was maybe one of the last times that maybe a British club went there that had this type of hassle because on the way back, um, our flight got cancelled. Um, you know, it was, it was too foggy to take off or something. So I'm thinking, oh, this well-developed country has not even got radar. You know, we've got to stay. Then we had to stay there another night. Um, and the next day, we got back. Uh, and this is ironic. This is like, you know, we, we flew out um, of the airport out of London. Um, so we, we sort of parked our cars. I can't remember where it was, uh, where we parked it. And then as we're coming into land, um, uh, something like, God, what was it? It would have been... It would have been the Friday morning. Yeah, we landed. Uh, and it must have been something like two o'clock in the morning. And a voice come over the tunnel. We are now landing at Gatwick Airport. And I looked, I can't remember, I think it was Rushy next to me. And I turned to Rushy and said, oh, that's Andy. He said, why? I said, we parked our cars at Heathrow. <laughs> that's where we <laughs> took off from. You know, and, that, and that was it. You know, we, we had to then be bussed across which took another two hours after we landed. I think we stayed in Harrow or somewhere like that, in a hotel where our cars were, uh, to go back. Um, oh, now, I lived in Mould at the time, in North Wales, in a flat with my wife. We'd not long been married in the summer. So, but there was no phones then. We never had a phone in the flat. We never had mobile phones. Um, you know, and it was like, my wife just wondered where I was. You know, um, and it was just, you know, them type of things, the club, you know, the, I, I, I was hoping that obviously the, the Welsh FA had informed the club that I'm going to be late, I'm not going to be back. Um, but believe it or not, I wasn't even the first team then, I had to go to Derby with the reserves and play <laughs> that weekend. So, you know, they, they could have given me the weekend off after all that, but no, they weren't yeah. in their mind. You know, well, rest, yeah, we, no rest yeah. there. <laughs> well, with Terry Boyle, he must have gone, to, yeah, the passport control and everything for Terry Boyle. I mean, I don't know if we left him there. <laughs> yeah, been less, hassle. <laughs> yeah, less, less hassle. Yeah. But they're, they're, they're the things that we had to come up against, you know. Oh, and by the way, we used to carry our own kit mm. on our own training gear. So, with training gear would be in one bag. You, you, most of your gear that you're wearing for the next couple of days while you're there. Um, and you know, in them days, you know, you're going to Russia and when there's a gang of you, you stood out that you weren't Russian, <laughs> you were Westerners. Um, and, you know, the amount of times that people used to look at you, they, they were looking at you if you had two heads. You know, it's just, yeah, different. <laughs> you know, you take your own boots with you. Um, look after yourself, really. You know, you didn't have kit men. And all that looked after us was um, we had Mike England, Dougie Livermore and the Doc, them three people. It was only later on, um, around about end of the 80s, I would say, that we uh, we had a, a guy called Ron Stiffel who used to play for Cardiff. He was a right back. Yeah, for, for um, Ron Stiffel. 
Yeah, well, Rom was like, I'd been with Rom since about 13, 14, 15. With the under-15s, he was a coach and things like that. So, to me and Rushy, his name was Uncle Rom. We always used to call him Uncle Rom. Um, and, and he did the kit for a few years. He was the first kit man we ever had. Um, so, it was, uh, yeah, it was all different. All different, but good. Good for team bonding and everything. Everybody's together. It didn't matter if you play for Everton or Liverpool or Man United or do you play for Port Vale, Wrexham or Swansea. You know, you, you still had to carry your own kit. Yeah. And uh, it's, you know, what, going back and looking back and there were some big names, you know, you, you had your likes of yourself, Rushy, Big Nev. Um, you had Mark Hughes. There was Mickey Thomas. There was Joey Jones. You know, some of the bit of big names and huge characters and everything. And mm. um, was there any... Uh, did, any uh, good moments, you know, any interesting characters that stood up for you that uh, there was really uh, true characters in, in within the squads, really? Well, yeah, when I, when I was sort of coming through, there was Joey Jones and Mickey Thomas, you know, they were massive characters. Um, the, it took everything with a pinch of salt, really. Um, but, you know, characters knew it when, when to, to sort of uh, have a good time. Um, as in, you know, having a laugh and a joke, and when not to. Um, but the, the, they were so, they were good pros at the same time, but different to your Leighton Phillipses and your, your Terry Yorats and people like that and your Brian Flynn's. But these guys, you know, all blended into the team. Um, I, I think playing for Wales was like just playing for a club because you all got on so well. I, I haven't been in many squads if at all, a squad where there's characters that you don't want to be there. Mm. You know, I, I don't think we've ever had, I don't think we've ever had that. You know, that uh, I don't even think any, any of the managers that I played under would have allowed that. Um, but there was a, there was a bond there that uh, we used to meet up on a, uh, on a Sunday. Um, and, the, and the ritual was we all went out for a drink. Mm. Didn't matter who you played for, um, you went out for a drink. Um, but most of the younger lads or the, the lads who come from the lower league clubs didn't buy a drink. <laughs> you know, we, we sort of made sure that they sort of blended in and felt comfortable so that when we put our training kit on the next day, they were quite comfortable being in our company uh, and not sort of treating us as, you know, you know these big lads who play for Everton, Liverpool, Man United. Um, you know, they were more comfortable. And I think it worked a treat. Um, I think at one stage, I think... Um, uh, who was it? Mike England tried to stop it, but it just got went over his head at the time. You know, they, he's got to realise, and he did realise why we were getting results mm. because of the team, the, the, the team bonding that we had. Do you know, with uh, with that in mind, you know, um, with with Wales in the eighties, you know, you had that bondage. You had some of the best. Um, I mean, it was like some of the biggest names in Welsh football and um, but I want to mention this one and I'm I kind of because we're having a nice laugh here and it's going to get downwards uh, but was you there was you playing the the game when jo, um, at Ninian Park when Jock Steen uh, passed away yeah yeah I played in that um, um, bit of a strange game in the fact that that's what happened at the end it wasn't until after the game um, but it was a it was a sad one because we beat them up there at Hamden Park I think Rushy scored a great goal, by the way. Um, it was a placed half volley. Beautiful. And um, I think Sparky, you know, was pretty new to, to football. You know, he, he hadn't played maybe 100 games for Man United, 50 games or whatever, if that. And he absolutely tortured Willie Miller and uh, Alex McLeish. They mm -hmm. couldn't live with him. They were bouncing off him. Uh, and a, what a good sort of partnership him and Rushy had then. You know, one who could get hold of it and the other one that could run in beyond. And there was little conflicts going on between, because we well, there was a few niggles going on in the game because um, Peter Nicholas and uh, Graham Sooners had a bit of history. And one of the hardest players I've ever played with and unsung heroes that I've played with, especially for Wales, I played with him at Cardiff as well, Robbie James. Ah, oh, underrated. He uh was... A colossal. He, he would like you wouldn't want to mess with him. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, he, he, there was there was things going on in games. Um, but we played well. We beat them up there. I think Joey Jones played centre half with me. 
that day up there. And he didn't give Kenny Dalglish a, cut, a kick. He booted him all over the park and he, uh, you know, he, uh, he kicked him rather than you know, give him a kick type of thing. But, uh, and then we got him down and uh, sadly, Davy Cooper, who's not with us, took the penalty, didn't he? Well, I think it was a harsh penalty against Dave Phillips, won it, handballed it. Um, yeah, it was, uh, it, was, it was sad in them respects that uh, Jock Steen had died after the game. But um, that must have been the pressure, you know, of that game. They still had to go into playoffs. I think they played Australia in a two-legged playoff home and away. Yeah. Uh, and got through to the cup final. I think it was, was it in, was it in Mexico or somewhere like that? Would have been? 84? Mexico. 84. That's it. No, that's yeah. in Mexico. Yeah. And, uh, so, yeah, it was, it was sad. I mean, and we played well enough. The big thing in that game is that, um, who's the keeper? Alan Ruff coming goal uh, because... Uh, what was the guy that played for Man United in goal? Goalkeeper? Oh, now, you're talking, now you're talking. Oh. He oh. played for Man United. Dropped, got dropped for the cup final, didn't he? Um, I played with him as well for Dundee. Um, God. Um, Mc, somebody was it? <laughs> More than no, you know what, we'll probably, it's, it, it probably the, the last one probably begins with a muck or something like that. Yeah, well, yeah. He, what's the name? He, he lost his contact lenses and he never had a spare set, <laughs> so they took him off and put uh, and pull Alan Ruff in. Now, Alan Ruff had this clown type of uh cloud over his head that he was a clown in goal, that he wasn't a good, but you don't get the amount of caps that he had for being a clown. And most probably that was the best decision that Jock Steen did on the night, mm. was changing the keepers because he had a tremendous game. Uh, once again, I thought we controlled the game and uh, we only needed a, a draw and they got a win with the, the penalty, which was sad. I, I mean, it was tough for me because I was playing against Graham Sharp um, and I'd never played against Graham before. But I'd always played with him. So I always thought that was my hardest game um, to play in the fact that I, you know, I'm playing against one of my best mates yeah, and he, he was one of my best mates in the side at Everton, but I've got to play against him international football. Completely different than playing against Ian Rush. Uh, I was only with Ian for four or five days, but I was with Sharpie for, you know, 10 months, 11 months of the year, 10 months of the year. For years. That was hard. And, and Andy Gray was another sub. Um, so that was, that was difficult. That was difficult. But like I said, I thought we did well enough to win the game. But unfortunately, Jock Steen that night, after the game, uh, died, yeah. And there's Alex Ferguson, who was his assistant or one of the coaches as well, you know, and he was standing right by him. And it seems a bit bonkers because, you know, it was like the mentor to, handing the torch over to Alex Ferguson, who goes on to have, uh, you know, a, a tremendous, tremendous career, mm. you know, not just with, I mean, he already had a tremendous career with, uh, I think, Correct me if I'm wrong, Kev, because I haven't really uh, I get confused with Alex Ferguson's managerial career because I don't know if he was if he was I know he went to Scotland. Aberdeen. But I don't know. Yeah? Aberdeen. Aberdeen. Yeah, Aberdeen, yeah, because it was after He won the cup win. I think he won the cup winners cup with yeah. Aberdeen. And he had a good side. I must admit he had a good side. You think the two lads that played for for Scotland, uh Willie Miller and Alex McLeish, two centre backs. Um they had a, a, a the lad black up front. Um, who went on to manage and also oh what's his name god he's larger than life <laughs> he's on Sky um, went to Bayern Munich to play oh it's not um, he's on Sky Sports did you say oh, yeah. that means you're going to you're gonna have to look now cheers Kev <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I'll, I'll get you his name in a minute I'll, I'll get you his name oh yeah. god I know him well as well I can't remember his name he'll kill me <laughs> Jesus Christ nah, um, he was shit <laughs> <laughs> uh, did he God. play for my mate? I don't know <laughs> Aston Villa he come over played for Aston Villa after back yeah. oh. he played play for Celtic as well yes he was oh for Christ's sakes do you know what I'm supposed to know my football like, do you know what people are going Matt Nally M Michael... I'm gone cheers Kev <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. Do, so, do you know yeah, what? Alan, Alan, Alan McAnally, yeah, he, he was there as well at the time. So, uh, oh, oh, was he? No, he wasn't. It wasn't Alec McNally. It was like McGee, Paul McGee, 
It was Is manager it? of, uh, yeah, Paul McGee played up front for him as well. So they had a decent side. Yeah. Uh, they had a, a, a left back called Doug Ruvy, who then got transferred to Chelsea. So most of the team, after they won the European Cup Winners' Cup, broke up. Uh, yeah. Gordon yeah. Strachan played for them as yeah, well. So really you think that team broke up, but, you know, Alex McLeish, I can't, I can't remember where he, he went to. He goes Celtic or Rangers, I think. Willie so, Miller. I think I think, he, I think Willie I think Willie Miller was the only guy that stayed there. Mm. Yeah, who was a great player, by the way. Yeah, it was. Just, you know what? It was absolutely tense because I was watching the. Um, there's a there's an old documentary. And the, and the keeper, the keeper went to Man United. He, he was the one <laughs> what's his name? Yeah. He's called the what's his name? Do you know what? I, I was he, I was on holiday once and he was in the same hotel as me. I can't remember his name. <laughs> Do you know what? I, I bet he's the same with me. Yeah. It's gonna be it's gonna be one of those moments, right? Where I'm gonna put in the description of our podcast. It's like two guys don't know what the hell their names are. You know, it's gonna yeah, be yeah, brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Oh, but, it's, uh, it's, like, it's like that. They always say to me, like you know, when we played against Brazil, they said, "Who did you change your shirt with?" I said, "I haven't got a clue," but I saw Ozzy's well, the same with me, is he? <laughs> you know? And you know, what, speaking of uh, speaking of Brazil, uh, you know, I'm gonna move um, let's move on to because mm. in the early '90s. Uh, Terry Yorath was the manager, you know, and he was supposed to be, you know, that it was said that if that would, if, if uh, Paul um, Bowden would have scored that penalty against Romania, they would have gotten to the USA and Wales would have had a probably decent, uh, decent uh, tournament in the United States. But I yeah. want to mention, because during this lockdown, they showed three uh, yes. Belgium matches. There was Brazil, it was Germany, and I can't remember the other one if it was Romania. Belgium. Huh? Belgium. Belgium. That's it. It was in Belgium. Right. Ryan say, gives his first game. Yeah, and I was going to say that if it was Romania, I'm glad I didn't remember that one because I still, even though I, I wasn't there, I was born in '96. But for me, you, if you watch that, you feel the other yeah. thing. I know? missed that game. I missed that game. I was um, I was out injured at the end of the season, so it was like. Um, it was one of them, would I have gone to the World Cup or not? I was at Cardiff then playing. Mm. So it was one of them that I played against Belgium. We beat Belgium. I think it was, was it 2 0 or 2 1? I can't remember. Ryan Giggs scored the free kick. I think it was 2 1, I think. Yeah, yeah. So um, that was my last game. Ryan Giggs is first, my last. <laughs> uh, and I'd just been dragged back into the squad after about a year being out. Um, and I was playing for Cardiff in the third division at the time. Yeah. And that was the big hoo-ha. And they couldn't understand why a, a guy from the third division was being called back into the squad after being out for a year. Um, and I, I must admit, it was most probably one of my best games that I'd play for Wales. It took a lot out of me, but um, it was one of the better games, the best games I'd played. You know, the, and people always ask me, you know, which which is your, you know, your favourite, two favourite games that you've, you've uh, that you you played your favourite game for Wales. And I'd say, well, I've got two, actually. And that's uh, my first cap and my last cap. And that yeah. was against Czechoslovakia uh, and against uh, Belgium. And I think that was my or two best performances, really, that I played for Wales, my first and my last. <laughs> I, ne I never got selected again. How can you play a really good game? Mustn't have played that well. <laughs> you know, no, that was me finished, more or less. I was 34, I think, coming up. Yeah, coming up to 34, I was 30, 33. So I was coming to the end of my career anyway. Um, and I picked up an injury. And most probably, well, I didn't really have a club for the following year, but I signed for Cardiff week by week again the following year. Yeah, and no, lasted until we got knocked out of Europe. And do you know what? With, with that in mind, uh, I'll go on to the Brazil and Germany game in a minute because with mm -hmm. Cardiff, um, I know we mentioned it in the last uh, <clears throat> podcast where we'd done. Um, the players you had, there was Robbie, there was you, there was Robbie James, there was, uh, I think Nathan Blake was bursting out into the scenes. Um, I think Damon... Hey, he, he certainly was bur bursting out in them days. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, if yes. he wasn't robbing a fruit machine, you know. <laughs> oh, hey, well, that, you can say that, I can't. Do <laughs> uh, you know what, I'd love to have him on the show because I want to know about that, uh, that chant, but... Um, cause, cause but yeah, it, I'm, sh I'm sure, Nathan, that there is something behind it. Yeah, the, the the story behind it, but it, I don't think it's about Nathan. You know, uh, I'm I'm not quite sure, but yeah, you know, he he was there. I, I can go through the team. We had oh. Gavin Ward in goal. Yeah, we had uh, Neil Neil. Oh yeah, I stayed with Neil. <laughs> the foot, Neil Matthews, right back. Yeah, but he Neil got Patton. injured. No, no, Lee come in later. He was quite young, Lee. Okay, Jason Perry, myself. 
Yeah. Um, and <sighs> Damon Searle. Demo, so, yeah, Demo. Demo, so. Then we had uh, Pena in midfield. Uh, Ramsey uh, from Leicester. Um, uh, Miller, Paul Miller. Uh, we had uh, Nick Richardson, Robbie James, Derek Brazil. You know, all these players. You know, yeah. Chris, Chris Pike up front. Pikey, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Barry Legend. Um, and, and then oh, Cohen, Cohen Griffiths. Another one, another one from Barry Legend. Yeah, yeah uh, and uh, obviously there was Carl Dale as well in and around the squad. He said uh, that Carl Dale had was, potential to go into the Wales squad. Yeah. Uh, the only thing with Carl is he, he picked up injuries always at the wrong time. You know, he'd get fit and he played one or two games and then all of a sudden, and he was a great player. But the one, that, the one guy that had come in about a couple of games before me um, and was a great signing for Cardiff was... Um, Neil, uh, Phil Stant. Oh, Stant, Stant, yeah. He was a great finisher. And what a great lad. Funny as hell. Yeah. Funny as hell. And then, you know, sadly enough, we all fell out with the chairman at the end of the year mm. um, through bonuses and this, that and the other. Um, and it's a bit sad, really, because that, that's, if that side, that, and if, you, if that, if the club would have spent another couple of hundred grand in the summer, um, I, I reckon that club would have got promoted again. Mm. Especially that's, the that's 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 you know. Well, you know, we were going to lose the likes of Blakey and maybe Damon Searle, but Damon Searle never went in the end. G Gavin Ward would have gone. But they only went because I think they seen the, the ambition wasn't there with the club as well. Uh, and they needed to step their game up. But uh, I always remember the story for Phil Stant that uh, he had a fallout with the chairman, Rick Wrong. I called him Rick Wrong. His name was Rick Wright. Yeah. Uh, who owned Pontins. Um, but he, he treated us all. On the he, he, yeah, yeah. Well, he treated the blue coats a little bit better than he treated his players. Uh, the way that he used to talk to them and everything, and you know, thought this is what, it, as if he owned them in one respect. But I always remember that Phil Stans had a club car, and uh, he left the club under a bit of a cloud. I think Phil, especially the chairman and, and Eddie May, uh, and I remember that <laughs> that uh, he had a club car and uh, he got a letter off uh, the chairman saying that uh, you're in possession of a club car um, if it is not delivered to the football club by Monday we will charge you X amount of pounds a week or a day for the car so Phil wrote Moretta back and saying uh, the car is ready for, select, uh, for pick up it is on my drive driveway if you do not pick it up by Saturday or, or Monday, I will charge you a car parking fee for the same amount that they were charging him a day for the car. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant! What a guy! <laughs> but that's so, the, oh. it's honest. It was like uh, Fred Carnos at times, but it was uh, it, it was good. They were a good bunch of lads. Um, and you know when you walk into a club and you actually get failed. Jason Perry, you know, was there. Um, uh, Blakey, they were young lads but needed guidance. And I think I was the last little, you know, cog in it all. You know, he got Phil Stance up front. He got the lad Ramsey in midfield from Leicester with Robbie James. Robbie could play anywhere and myself. Um, and I, I think the team then, because we had that spine going through the middle, that it worked a treat. And, then, you know, that you've got to give the manager credit for that. Mm. Um, but it was, it was like I'd never dealt with with it like that before in my life down at the lower league and you know it helped me in the in the way of when I went into coaching and managing it, it helped me uh, more to know what you have to do with players you know after you do have to do repetitive things really at the lower end of the leagues uh, than you do with sort of players at the higher end so that, yeah I learned a lot from that and I learned a lot of things not to do as well do you know with uh, let's go on to then the Wales v Brazil and Germany game in the early 90s mm. big wins you know uh, um, what was that like for you to to be part of and captain as well oh, we're brilliant I mean I played against Brazil but I've not been beat, beat by Brazil um, we played them in the 80s as well at Ninian Park 50 odd thousand and in about eight, eight, 82 83 something like that you'll have to look that up um, and uh, it was a boiling hot uh, Sunday. I think it was about a two, three o'clock kickoff. 
Um, oh, it was it was baking. I think Socrates played for them. Uh, Edda, the, the left winger, and um, I had a goal disallowed, believe it or not, <laughs> on a little bit of a run through, little ball, chipped the keeper, um, but somebody was offside. Somebody about half a mile away, <laughs> over in Canton, uh, got caught offside. And um, yeah, uh, that one was a memorable game. And then we played them at, um, the, obviously, the Cardiff Arms Park. And uh, we, we beat them, which was, you know, it was a tough game. You know, they were Brazil. You know, even when they put a reserve side out. They're good enough to beat us, but we found a little bit extra. Uh, we roughed them up a bit. Um, and I think the same with Germany as well. We did exactly the same. But And it takes a little bit more roughing the Germans up than maybe the Brazilians because they, they are made of sterner stuff, the, the Germans. Yeah. Um, in, the, in that respect, you know, they always used to play and still do, I feel, play with two big, big centre halves who have always been the. The, the sort of the pillars for them uh, in every era, really. Um, you know, they, they'd have somebody in midfield like a Lothar Matthias who could stick his foot in as well. Uh, strikers who could look after themselves. So, you know, they, they knew what it was like to play British football as well. Um, and when they had the likes of Klinsmann, I think that German um, win was a bigger win than the, 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 the Brazil win because we were playing against first team players. Um, you know, Brazil, you could argue the foul. Well, he wasn't a regular playing for Brazil at the time, but he got his chance because he was playing against Wales, you know, on a cold February night or something. But uh, no, against Germany, it was a competitive match as well. I think that was a bigger result uh, and a better result because we played against a better team, you know, playing against the likes of Kl Klinsmann, up front, Voller, um, Buchwald at the back and Lothar Matthias. You know, they, they are really, really good players. Moving on into the future, then uh, you had uh, a few stints at uh, various other clubs. I can, how can I remember the Germans and the Brazilians? <laughs> I was going to say, remember, remember the Germans. <laughs> and you can't remember Scottish people that you know dearly. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lie, it's all lies. <laughs> oh, oh, well. That's I mean, what happens when you get old. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? It's going to be yeah. literally, it's going to be episode 30, part two, uh, and it's. Try and guess the names and leave a comment on below. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We could have a quiz, really, couldn't we? Yeah. I might get it by the next time I'm on. <laughs> uh, but um, just moving on to your time as a coach and manager, you know, you, you manage at uh, Shrewsbury and Chester. Uh, especially when you were at uh, Shrewsbury uh, Town, you helped uh, Shrewsbury um, avoid relegation and uh, you kept them up in the uh, the football league and everything. But it was this one particular moment that stood out for you and it's because um, you were the manager that infamous me. Uh, infamously, uh, famously beat uh, Everton in the FA Cup in 2003, um, and David Moyes was manager at the time. Uh -huh. So, um, would you can you uh, tell us uh, the story of when you uh, beat your, uh, Everton in the FA uh, Cup? Look, I mean, you know, my team talk was around how how poor I thought Everton were. Then, you know, I think it was Dave Moyes' first year in charge. Actually, um, I think it was Wayne Rooney's first FA Cup game. Um, now we played them in pre-season because obviously I had a good relationship with uh, Dave Moyes um, so we played them in, in pre-season they beat us 2-0 but the pitch was perfect it was like um, it was like a bowling green but my two centre forwards caused them problems a lad called Luke Rogers who was only about 19 and Nigel Jemson who played for Notts Forest Sheffield Wednesday and they caused them a few problems. But I'd added to the squad. I'd got the likes of um, uh, Ian Woney, uh, who's now assistant manager at Burnley. Um, I had Mark Atkins in midfield. Uh, and it, it just, the only problem I had was defensively. Um, but I went out and sort of said to the lads, look, the side, the town. So I said, they're playing a the right back, who's a centre back. Um, and he's making his first appearance for the club as a right back and he can't he can't play right back. I'm telling you he's not a right back. So we earmarked him. We earmarked the other side, which was Dave's up Dave Unsworth, believe it or not. But I always thought you could have a chance against Dave. Um so we earmarked it with the wide play, but also the forwards coming off, flicking balls on 
um, you know, over the heads, ball coming in and just swooping it over with your foot uh, for the quickie Luke Rogers to get on. But my main concern was not Wayne Rooney picking the ball up deep and running at us. It was Lad Radinsky, uh, the Canadian, who played oh, with his pace up front. And the big thing was, I said, they played on our pitch when it was perfect. We're now playing on a cow's field. Because in them days, Shrewsbury after December was no notorious for being a cow's field. It was absolutely awful. The balls would be bobbling everywhere. And that's why I said, let Wayne have it in midfield. You know, when he drops off, let him have it. Because the ball, he'll, get, he'll, he'll have another chance to get the ball back. And it worked a treat, scored two goals. And, uh, you know, it, it was... I wouldn't say it was comfortable, but it was deserved. Um, Dave Moyes wished us all the best. Didn't come in for a drink after. Um, he was he was really upset about it, or upset with his lads. Uh, but you know, I had the decency to phone me on the Monday morning to sort of say, "Well, didn't realise how well you played. I've looked back over the video yesterday, um, and actually seeing how well you played, and you deserved the win. Congratulations!" So that that was nice of him to do that. Um. Going on to Never Chester. won a game after that and got relegated. That? Never won a game in the league after that and got oh. relegated. Come on, Ken. What's going on? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's what happens sometimes in football. Some players think they're better than they are then. Uh, and then you, you lose certain players. Uh, when I, I, lost, I lost three players. And them three players were the, were the, the centre of my side. I went on about it before uh, with Phil Stamp, yourself, Ramsey. And then... Um, Robbie James being the, the, the centrepiece in the team. I lost my entire centrepiece. I lost the centre forward, Nigel Jemson, Mark Atkins, the centre midfield player. And I also lost my centre half, uh, which was a massive blow lad for, who we, we got from Plymouth. Um, and they, 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 they were the three big earners at the club as well. Yeah. So how, how do you actually go and bring that type back in? You don't, you don't have that finance. But the good thing about that at, at uh, Shrewsbury, we went into that season 600 grand in debt. Uh, and coming out of that season, we ended up with 700 grand in credit and turned down just under a million pounds for two players to, to Cardiff. So, you know, the, 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 the club was going in the right direction other than staying in the league. And like I said, we never won a game after that in the league. Um, and subsequently, we got, we got relegated. You know, with the, you were talking about the financials and the finances with the club and everything, mm. I wanted to mention uh, just then about uh, Chester City because um, it, it really stood out for me. And this is the t- type of character, you know, type of, you know, there's a lot of positives about you, Kev, uh, as a person mm. as well. And, you know, and uh, during the time of uh, financial trouble with um, Chester City, it was under Terry Smith. Uh, and I'll mention Terry in a minute, but uh, it said that while in financial trouble, you drew £5,000 to pay the water bill out of your own pocket. Yeah, well, the, the thing is with that is that, that we were playing again. It was Terry Smith wasn't there then. There was a fellow called Mark Gutman. And things were going downhill at the club. We were going in debt into debt. We had the Bayleafs turning up to try and take stuff that uh, wasn't even ours, <laughs> you know, from the club. Um, and the chief exec just, uh, realised the bailiffs were going to come around to uh, cut off you know, the, the, the water it was and they were going to come around and cut it off so he made himself scarce he wanted this to come to a head because the only way it's going to end if it does come to a head so they cut the water off we had a game against Tramier in the pre-season which was going to bring in the excess of maybe 10 grand into the football club that's 10 grand is so so important in pre-season that's why you have pre-season games at home against your bigger clubs uh, and I think they should do it more by sending a full squad to lower league teams to help these teams out, especially the local ones. They don't have to travel far and go and support that club for them uh, and go and play a, a, a pre-season game. Get a full house there. Get 40000 in the kitty. Do it for a freebie for them. Um, so we were playing Tramia. It wasn't going to be a full house, but we'd make considerable amount of money. You know, it's it's all cash coming in. And I thought, well, you know, what, what do I do? You know, the, some of the lads might be going without wages at the end of the week as well. So I went down, drew five grand out. cost me 75 quid to draw that money out, actually, because I didn't have it in my account. So I went into an overdraft. Um, and uh, I paid it, but under the understanding with the the, the lady in the in the shop 
that I took five grand from the till plus 75 quid after the game, which I did. So, yes, I did pay it, but then again, I did get it back straight away. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not stupid. You know, I knew the club was going into a position where maybe, and it did, went into administration, which was a shame, really, because it was, uh, yeah, it was a nice club, nice club to work for. And, um, you know, we were going, we had some good kids coming through um, and we had some good players there as well. It was a great catchment area to be in to, to go and pick your pickings from your likes of Liverpool. You know, if Liverpool don't want a schoolboy um, or, or somebody on their apprenticeship, then we can go and get them give them an opportunity. And we did. We did. We did it on a couple of times. You know, with uh, that, I've got a, one or two more questions for you, uh, Kevin. It's absolutely been brilliant to listen to your story. Yeah, yeah. Come sure. back. Absolutely fantastic. Um, I want to mention a couple of, couple of names, really, uh, for you, and just to give them a, just a brief, you know, it could be a sentence, just could be one word or a nice little mm. story, but you can go wherever. Uh, I'll just mention these uh, names for you. Uh, Duncan Ferguson. Uh, I've only really got to know Duncan um, over the the last few years. Um, I wasn't at Everton when Duncan come. Um, it, you know, he's, from what he's done as a manager when he was there and as an interim manager, he's done really, really well. And he looks destined if he's going to be a manager sometime. Um, but, you know, his heart's in the right place. You know, he's at the right time. You know, it really surprised me because when he was playing, I didn't think he had that in him to be a coach or a manager. I didn't, I think, you know, you know, from what I can believe, he didn't really totally like football. Um, but, you know, he, he, I think he must have fallen in love with the game again. Yeah. Um, Pat Van der Maal. No comment. <laughs> All right, no worries. Um, Neville Southall. Good mate. Um, the best of the best, by far. Um, and yeah, he, he's he's just like he, you know. I think Nev knows what I think about him, you know. And uh, you know, was he 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 was top draw. No, <laughs> he was top top draw. I've never seen anybody like him, you know. And uh, I I see keepers now, and I think what they do, uh, I think Nev would be cringing. You know, he'd be cringing there, looking at it, thinking, why hasn't he caught that? <laughs> you know um, and you see it time and time again the amount of balls he used to catch rather than punch or you know palm away was, was tremendous he he wouldn't make he, he would catch balls where a lot of other people would just dive and tip it round the post but never move across his goal and catch it and maybe start an attack off mm. the, the, the only time he ever dived for the ball was maybe last minute we were winning 1-0 and wanted to maybe sort of uh be on the floor when he got the ball. So it took him an age to get up to, to start things going, wasting a bit of time. Uh, Terry Yorth. Terry, Terry did really, really well once he accepted uh, the lads. Um, I think he, he found it very, very hard to actually... I, I think international players, even though they're international players, they still need to be told what to do. And that's something that he didn't do when he first came in. But I think once he warmed to it, and realised what players he got. And he found the system that suited the players. Worked the treat. Yeah. Eddie May. Eddie, Eddie was a bit of a bully, really, I suppose. In one way. Um, but he was, he was successful. You know, I think his judgment on the players to bring in, to add to the team, to make the team better, was really, really good. Um you know, but I think, you know, like everything, you, you, you know, you, you say sometimes, well, he's fortunate because he had good players, but you've got you to take your hat off to somebody who actually brings them players in anyway. Yeah. So, no. you know, it's, you can say that, oh, yeah, well, you know, he's lucky that he had good players, but he brought them players in to actually blend together and realised that he most probably needed experience with youth. And that's what he had. Maybe he had the youth there, but he didn't have the experience for them to actually become better players as well. Uh Last individual, uh, and we already mentioned him before, but it was Mike England. Mike, <laughs> Mike was uh, Mike was a character in his own way, really, um, and still is. You know, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have thought he was the brightest, uh, but he was. You know, he knew what he wanted. Uh, he was different, and it was at a time when I think that you know there was a lot of old players coming to the end of the the careers. 
uh, and how do you actually there's no nice way of doing it is there and i must admit a lot of the a lot of the older players um thought he was a bit of a buffoon but the young lads like myself and rushy we loved him because of the way that he used to talk to us um and you know the the way that he's given us our chance at international level as well but your older players i think resented him really that didn't really respect him as maybe what they should have but you know we we were so so close on a number of occasions but i think that was maybe um uh, you know mike's na- naivety really going into games not looking at on a whole um being too positive sometimes you know, played against Iceland and I think that all he wanted to do was talk about how many goals we were going to score <laughs> rather than, you know, not conceding goals was the most important thing and that was the night the floodlights went on at uh, the Vetch. Oh yeah, there was the there was like a fire or something, wasn't it? And, uh, and the floodlights I, went I don't know what it was, but it was uh, it was about a 20 minute delay and, you know, that, that really, you know, deadened the, the, the game really and I played at the back with um, Di, no, no, Die, was Die in goal? I think Die was in goal because was, there was something like seven players from Swansea City playing that night. Yeah. Um, so Die had been in goal. Sorry? And especially at the Vetch as well, so you, it was a bit no surprise really that you got a lot of Swansea They were City. all attacking players. <laughs> no, <laughs> defenders. <laughs> so there was me, Joey and Peter Nicholas playing in the back three. First time we'd ever done it. Uh, and all he talked about is you know, when we get the second and when we get the third and then the fourth goal, rather than saying, you know, we just even if we win the game 1-0, you know, it'll be a result. Um, but the biggest surprise for me was that night is that when he picked the side and he picked the three at the back, um, automatically I thought, well, you know, Joey Jones and Peter Nicholas, they'll pick up and I'll just be a sweep around them. Ideal. No, he had me picking up. Now, I'm not, and he had Peter Nicholas as the spare man. Now, for me, Peter Nicholas wasn't the quickest man in the, in the world at all, you know. And uh, I think it could have worked if he played me as a sweeper because of my pace. Um, and then Joey was a good man marker. You know, he wasn't a slouch, as in running, but he was a good man marker. Um, you know, if you asked him to do a job, he would do a job. And I think Peter could have done that job as well. But I think that was his biggest slip up. And, uh, you know, the final question of the podcast here today, and I always ask this question, I've asked you this uh, before, but it's always nice to hear it again. And uh, I've always asked anyone who comes on my show, and and it's always, how do you look back on your career? Um, I did, did better than I expected. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when, when you start off and then you see things, especially when you're into a team that ain't doing very well and not winning things, then, you know, to do what I've done, you know, you've, you've done something right. I mean, there's a lot of players going into the game now and it's they're looking at how much they're going to earn on the next contract rather than what they're going to win in the next contract. Um, and then that's that's a massive difference. You know, the mentality's changed um, a, a lot in both ways. But like I said, it, it was all about winning things when we were coming through. And you, you couldn't be... I, I, I wouldn't say we were like, you know, millionaires or anywhere near that. But, you know, we're comfortable. But to be comfortable, you have to be successful in our area. These days, you don't have to be successful to be comfortable. In fact, you don't have to be successful to be millionaires. <laughs> so that, that is a, is a mass, massive difference, you know. And if you look at it on a whole and you want to know, I, I was on a week, what it take somebody like you a month to earn, right? These players now are on a week, what it take you a lifetime to earn. <laughs> So, you know, yeah, that is the yeah. difference. It's a massive, massive difference. And I think, yeah, there is a connection lost between players and supporters. You know, you get a calendar these days from the football club. And if, say, a certain player is on, he's the calendar for February, he will not sign February. He will sign the front. But he won't personalise it and put it on his picture. No, I think that's a big difference as well. Yeah, and but then again, they've got to be—they've got to be told and they've got to be made. Yeah, and if they're not, they won't. No, I was going to say because when I started this podcast, you know, um, 
a lot of uh, it's like uh, when I first had you on the show, all my mates were going, Kevin Ratcliffe, really? And I thought, yeah. I'm not earning money out of this. I mean, this is just for fun, you know, yeah. this is me, you know, yeah. time. But I, I felt very successful when I've got you on the show because of your background yeah. in Wales and that. So it's like for me, um, you know, I, I have got plans, like I told you before we started uh, recording this, I got plans yeah. for this podcast, but I mean, I've always looked forward to anyone. Well, anyone. you've got to have a script, haven't you? Because, yeah. you know, if you, if you don't have a script, then all of a sudden, if it dries up, yeah, you know, <laughs> and, and, yeah. well, not everybody's the same. Not everybody yeah. can actually talk and talk you and go into something without you mentioning it. But if it does dry up, you've got to have something to back back up, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and it's always been like that. And, uh, but that's because um, when you say script, I mean, I've got a background in theatre and Andrew, you know, yeah. script writing and everything, but I've always thought that's helped me a lot because I that's can good. confidently and comfortably speak to you and anyone on the show. Mm. Cause I'm, a, I mean, I grew up watching football and being an editor, yeah. you know, and that's my dad's fault. And then go and support Barry town. It's given that level yeah. of ability to do a bit of both and kill two birds, one stone, you know? So, mm. but, here we are. That's my success. You know, I got you on the show. Oh, good. Well, good luck. <laughs> yeah, thank you very good much. Good luck with everything, and uh, I'll most probably talk to you again sometime. Oh yeah, hopefully, I hopefully do. Yeah. Um, so this is this the beauty of it, you know? Because I mean, I'm always welcoming anyone else onto the show, and okay. that's it, really. All right, Pat. Yeah. All right. So anyway, guys, uh, thanks so much. That was Kevin Ratcliffe on the Dragon's Voice podcast. So if you'll be able to see this um, very, very soon and also make sure you give the like, share, subscribe to, to the channel. Also follow us on Twitter at Dragon's Voice 20 and I'll see you all very soon. Take care.